Uh, the sermon title this morning is Goodness Gracious. And I hope that as we uh, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, I hope that we will see the points of connection between the title and what we are commanded to do. Because what we are going to see in these three short verses, we're going to see three commands for every believer. Three commands for every believer. Uh, they all have a little jingle, so maybe it'll help, help, help us remember them. The first one is, do right with all of your might. The second one is, discipline wrong all day long. And the third one is, exhort to comport. And yes, I did, I did look at a thesaurus to, to find a word that rhymed with exhort and meant what I wanted it to mean. <laughs> so do right with all your might, discipline wrong all day long, and exhort to comport. Uh, let's read here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, starting in verse 13. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Let's pray. Lord, this morning uh, it's our prayer that you would teach us from your word. Uh, we are mindful that we are all fallen, we are all sinful, but we praise the one whom you sent to save us, to restore the relationship that we've broken between you and us. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that your spirit this morning would empower all of us to learn from your word. Amen. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the phrase that, you know, a book is just so good you can't put it down. Uh, you may even have experienced that a time or two. Well, uh, a critic of a writer uh, sort of flipped that on its head and said, I once read a book that once I put it down, I just couldn't pick it back up. <laughs> and unfortunately, probably more books fall under that heading than the other way around. And uh, the point of connection there with what we're going to look at this morning is I wonder, when I look at my own life, if someone were to be writing a biography of it, I wonder if my life wouldn't just look a little bit more like that, that second book, that once you put it down, you can't really pick it up. At least that's how we feel uh, more often than not. Uh, as we walk through life putting one foot in front of the other, it seems like... Uh, our name is not written in lights anywhere, and there's not very much interesting about who we are. So, this takes us directly to our passage. Verse 13, as for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Before we jump into the first point, it might help to give you a little bit of context on uh, Thessalonians. Uh, the first time we run into the Thessalonians is in Acts chapter 17, and it's there that Paul is traveling along what was called the Ignatian Way. There's a major uh, trade route that ran across Greece and Asia Minor, Asia Minor, or Turkey, that area. And it also happens to be a port city. So it's, it's right on the ocean. It's in, a, it's in a very secluded little port, which makes it nice. Uh, and it was a very active hub. Actually, in Paul's day, it was the second largest city in Greece. And in your and my day, it's still the second largest city in Greece. Uh, so there's a lot of similarities with the present day Thessalonica and the ancient day Thessalonica. But Paul comes to uh, Thessalonica, and as was his custom, we read in, in Acts 17, he went into the synagogues and started preaching, uh, started preaching the Jews about pre preaching to the Jews about Jesus Christ. Well, it turns out that not very many of the Jews uh, were persuaded. They didn't think that Jesus was actually the Messiah. But there were several uh, Greeks, God-fearing Greeks, so uh, Gentiles that were in the, in the synagogues, that thought he was onto something and believed what Paul was saying. And several leading women as well. And so that forms basically the beginning of the Thessalonican church, or the Thessalonians. Um, what happens, though, very quickly, uh, we know that Paul was there for at least three weeks, maybe longer, we're not sure, but very quickly, the Jews from the synagogue that don't believe become jealous because Paul all of a sudden has this following 
uh, at least so they think, they're really following Jesus, but they're no longer following them, which was the problem. And so they come to the house of a man named Jason, which is where Paul was staying, and they want Paul. They want to drag him before the courts. Well, it turns out that Paul had already left at that point, and so they drag Jason and a few of the other Christian brothers before the court, and they say, these guys have been harboring the man who's turned the whole world upside down. They actually use that phrase, the man who's turned the whole world upside down. Uh, and so in, in uh, payment to get released, basically they make some sort of arrangement that they won't harbor Paul again. And it seems like if you read 1 Thessalonians, um, let's see, 1 Thessalonians 2.18 actually, is where Paul says he wants to come and visit the Thessalonians again, but Satan has hindered him from doing that. It could very well be that this bond or this security that we read about in Acts 17 is Satan hindering him. Because Jason may have made a deal with the government, effectively saying, you know, we won't allow Paul to come back here um, in order to maintain peace. So that could be what's going on there. Uh, so we know that at least Paul lived with the Thessalonians for at least three weeks, maybe longer than that. Afterwards, he wanted to come back, but couldn't, and so he wrote 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians, we get a bit of an update on the state of the church. Uh, it's a small book, so if you just uh, glance over to chapter 1, we read there in verse 3, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. So we see that the church there in Thessalonica is actually fairly healthy. It's a healthy church. They're loving one another more and more, as we ought to. Their faith is growing more and more. But like all of us, that doesn't mean they are perfect. And so we skip down then to verse 13. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Or do right with all of your might. So a few things to note to begin with. Uh, he says, brothers, as for you, brothers, this is where I get the notion that these commands we're going to hear are for all of us. Because Paul now is speaking to the brethren, the men and women who believe in Jesus Christ, their children who believe in Jesus Christ. God is speaking to what we might call the true believers. Uh, he's speaking to uh, the church which by extension includes us. So this is for all of us. He's not speaking, for instance, like in Timothy, in many places where he's speaking specifically to Timothy, just to the pastors or to the elders. In this case, he's speaking to all of us. So that's, that's kind of the bad news, is you're not off the hook. So brothers, Paul's talking to every, every believer. And secondly, do not grow weary. Uh, just a point of translation is that we could, we could translate this as uh, do not lose your enthusiasm. Uh, it's basically the same idea, but a little different uh, angle on it. Do not grow weary or don't lose your enthusiasm for doing good. And this is really the crux, this phrase, doing good. What is it that Paul means by doing good? Well, I think we need to look at the greater context to understand what he means when he says that phrase, doing good. So just scan your eyes up to verse 6 of chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you, brothers, so again, talking to the brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. So in the context of verses 6 through 12, Paul doesn't seem to be talking about what initially comes to my mind in verse 13 when he says doing good. I initially think of good works. This is uh, Paul saying don't grow weary in doing good things, doing 
what we tend to think of as the extra things in our life, above and beyond our normal everyday work, uh, what good works are we doing? Uh, that's, that's what tends to pop into my mind when I see that word and when I, when I hear that phrase, good works. Well, it turns out earlier in the book, uh, chapter 2, 17, uh, when starting in verse 16, Paul says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. So we do have that phrase a little bit earlier on. And back up just a little bit more to chapter 1, verse 11. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. Okay, so what I think is going on here might be what we don't want to hear, but it might be what we do want to hear. It's that there's not a hard and fast distinction between good works as this extra category that we should be performing and our everyday work that we do every day. Because verses 6 through 12 is talking about the contrast between people who are busy at work and people who are busy bodies, lazy or idle, not working. And Paul follows that up by saying, do not grow weary in doing good. In other words, what he says in Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, there are several points of clarification that we should make, especially in light of verse 12, which says to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. We have a tendency, we've always had a tendency, and we probably always will have a tendency to be like a clock where the pendulum swings way too far to the left and then way too far to the right and back and forth. More often than not, you'll find that the truth is somewhere in the middle, not at the polar extremes. And in this case, uh, we have some, I think, some fuzzy thinking on, on this notion of work, on this notion of vocation. So first of all, I'm just going to make four points that relate to our work. First of all, you are working to provide for the needs of your family. You are working, you ought to be working, to provide for the needs of your family. We see that here. We see this uh, very clearly in 1 Timothy 5.8, which says, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Speaking, of course, not to the person seeking work and not able to find it, but to the person who is willingly lazy or idle. But note that it does not say, and this is where it starts to hit us, I think, stronger, uh, it does not say, but if anyone does not provide extravagantly for his relatives. That's not in the text. Uh, and that leads us into point two. You are working to have extra to share with those in need. So point number one, you ought to be working to provide for your family. Secondly, you ought to be working to gain extra, to get extra, to share with those who are in need. This is all over the place. Acts 20, 35. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus and how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Likewise, in Ephesians 4, Paul gives the example of the thief and says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So the notion of Robin Hood is a little bit suspect. Paul would encourage Robin Hood to stop stealing and do honest work and give to the poor. Don't stop giving to the poor, just earn it honestly, earn it rightly, and earn extra that you might share with those who need it. 1 Timothy 6 is when it gets really directly pointed at us. As for the rich in this present age, which includes everyone in this room. Charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works. There's that phrase again. To be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So we are encouraged then 
not to not make money, but we are encouraged to make money for the purpose of sharing with others and for the purpose of investing. Don't let people trick you by telling you that a 30-year investment is long-term. <laughs> They're lying to you. They may not know it, but they are. 30 years is not a long time. And when you die at the 29-year mark or the 35-year mark, the long time starts. And so the question is, are we doing what God tells us to here, to be rich in good works now, to be generous and ready to share now, so that we are preparing for eternity? So that we're investing in eternity, where, as Paul says, which is truly life. Okay, so first point of clarification, you're working to provide for the needs of your family. Secondly, you ought to be working to gain extra to share with others. And then <clears throat> third, third and fourth, it's not wrong to work a normal job. And fourth, it's not wrong to work in a full-time ministry job. Both. Yes, they're both true. Because today, again, we're presented with a false dichotomy. There are some in this camp that would say, full-time ministry, that's, that's really not right. I mean, Paul was a tent maker. You should be working to provide for your own uh, support. And yeah, you should be doing other things, but you, you should be a tent maker. And there's others that would say, well, you should just be working a normal job and, and being what perhaps Watchman Nee would call the normal Christian life or uh, an ordinary Christian. You should be working a normal job and then supporting others. Or you could read verse 12 here, now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. And you could miss the fact that Paul's not talking to everyone when he says that. And he's not making an absolute statement when he says that. It's not wrong to work a normal job. The evidence is right here. Paul is, is encouraging the Thessalonians. You ought to be engaged in work. You ought not to be lazy. You ought not to be idle. You ought to be engaged in work. But the fourth point, it's not wrong to work in a full-time ministry job. And of course, the first person you have issue with, if you think that's wrong, is Jesus. Because he spent three years living off of the good graces of God's people. So we probably don't need to go any farther than that. But Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 9 and 1 Timothy 5, uh, as he quotes the Old Testament, suggesting that those who sow spiritual things should also reap material things from those whom they are working with or working for. In fact, he makes that in this, in this very passage, 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, verses 7 through 9. He's making the point that they have the right to gain material benefit from the Thessalonians, but they did not make use of it. All right, so those are the, those are the points of clarification when it comes to work. Uh, we, we would do well to keep these things ingrained our, in our mind and not allow extremists, maybe, to push us one way or the other. Because God has called each of us to a different position, to a different post. And what we want to do is to make our post everybody's post. And that's not the way it works. God has a unique position for each of us. So bringing this all back around to verse 13, what in the world does this have to do with verse 13? Uh, Paul is encouraging us not to grow weary in our everyday work. We ought not to be losing our enthusiasm when it's day 5,392 on the same job. <clears throat> and we're doing the exact same thing that we did on day 4,673. And it's going to be the same on day 7,601. Many of you have, have had the privilege of going on a short-term missions trip, which I think would fall within our general conception of good works, right? This is, this is a, a good work that we're doing. But you'll note, as you're on that trip, you don't actually need a lot of encouragement. You experience what many people note as a spiritual high, right? Even though in many cases you are seeing things uh, that, that make you cry, that you can't believe with your eyes, and it's sort of an emotional journey. Nevertheless, you are actually encouraged by the work that you're doing. And as you reach out to others, 
you find yourself being filled up. So it really, I, I don't think it would make much sense if Paul was encouraging us to keep on in good works because in some ways, good works sort of perpetuate themselves. So he's not saying stay encouraged on your short-term missions trip. What he is saying is stay encouraged on your long-term missions trip because that's always, always where the problems come. The long-term, whether you are a full-time pastor or a full-time mother or a full-time teacher or a part-time this, that, and the other, the long-term is where we tend to get discouraged. The long stretches of putting one foot in front of the other one foot in front of the other. That's where we need the encouragement. That's where we need to not grow weary in doing everything that we do unto the Lord. There's a man named Joseph Martin who was a Revolutionary War uh, Brigadier General. He says this. He'd been marched so much, or he'd been marched all over the place, uh, and he was so beat out that I have fallen asleep while, making, while walking down the road and not being sensible of it, I have just jostled against someone in the same situation. So the guy next to him, they're both sleeping as they're marching. And when permitted to stop and have uh, uh, the superlative happiness to roll myself in my blanket and drop down on the ground in the bushes or in the briars or thorns or thistles and get just an hour or two of sleep, reader, believe me, for I tell a solemn truth, that I have felt more anxiety, undergone more fatigue and hardship, suffered more in every way in performing one of those tedious marches than I ever did in fighting the hottest battle I was ever engaged in. The climatic points, whether for better or worse, in some ways are easier than the long stretches in between. The long stretches where it feels like we're doing nothing or it feels like we're just doing the same thing over and over and over. Paul's encouragement to us is do not grow weary in doing good. Continue in the post that God has placed you and continue doing it for the Lord. Do right with all of your might. That takes us now to the second point, verse 14. Discipline wrong all day long. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Now this is the, this is the point at which the sermon sort of turns and uh, gets a little tense. He says, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter. So I thought, you know what? Let's see, 2 Thessalonians, it's a small book, right? Uh, what does he say in this letter? What is he commanding in this letter? Obviously, by implication, lots of scriptures indicate that we should be doing various things. But all I wanted to do was, let's just see what the commands are in 2 Thessalonians. So, I made a list. In chapter 2, 2, we're told to not be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. Chapter 2, 3, let no one deceive you in any way. Chapter 2, 15, stand firm. Again in 2.15, hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Chapter 3.1, pray for us. Chapter 3.6, now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness. 3.12, such persons we command to do their work quietly and earn their own living. And then 3.13, what we just read, do not grow weary in doing good. It's a piece of cake, right? I mean, that's only, what, nine, nine or ten commands? So that should be pretty simple. And it would be, except for one, one little command that he has in here. Um, I hate to say it, but uh, chapter 215, hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. The bad news is that includes everything in here. So with one command, he, he sort of says, you know what, all of the commands that you see in here are what you should be obeying. Now obviously we haven't had Paul speaking to us directly, but we have his letters, and then by extension the, the other epistles in the New Testament, and the traditions, which refers mostly to the Old Testament, and what Jesus taught them. So I thought, well, okay, if we're supposed to obey everything in the Bible, let's just take a look 
how many commands are there in the New Testament? So I, I went to Google and I did a search, list of New Testament commands. And if you do the same, this will be one of the first documents that, that pops up. I don't know why you guys are laughing. Isn't that how you find out information? Uh, 10, or 1,050 New Testament commands. 1,050 New Testament commands. Let that set in for a, a moment and realize that there's only 613 in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament's a lot larger than the New Testament. So per capita, we have way more to do than they ever had to do in the Old Testament. Undoubtedly. Now, I don't necessarily uh, endorse this organization. I don't really know anything about them. But the list is interesting. It, it breaks it out by category. So there's, there's seven abstains. There's seven things to avoid. There's two things to awake to. There's 74 Bs. There's 30 B nots. There's 14 Bewares. There's five things to charge, five things to consider, two things to covet, five things to feed, four things to flee from. Uh, seven things about giving, 100 lets, 12 let nots, 42 let uses, 8 let us nots. Yes, and it keeps on going. And then it ends with 200 miscellaneous commands. <laughs> so here it is. Uh, come check it out if you're interested or look it up online. Um, we're, we're laughing because I think we're nervous, right? <laughs> Really? Really? Uh, yeah. Goodness gracious. This is, this is a good point at which to insert that. Goodness gracious. The reality is we actually do have a standard to which we are to conform our lives. We actually do have a standard. We tend to think, I don't know, I don't know who introduced this, but we tend to think that the Old Testament is all law-based and the New Testament is all grace-based. And they just miss the grace in the Old Testament and they miss the law in the New Testament and they miss, therefore, what God has called us to. Now, you can keep every one of those 1,050 commands and not get to heaven. You're not going to get to heaven by keeping the commands. You get to heaven by believing in Jesus Christ and accepting His payment for your sin, accepting His perfect, sinless life. But what these commands are is defining who you are after you've been saved. In other words, if you believe in Jesus Christ, this is what your life will look like. And if it doesn't, you need to make some mid-course adjustments. And that's where verse 14 here comes into play. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Note that we are talking about believers. Note that we are talking about believers. Verse 6, now we command you brothers. It says brother again. Verse 13, brothers. So when Paul says if anyone, he's not saying unbelievers. He's saying if any believer does not obey what we have said here. Again, this is another point where we've done some sloppy thinking. Because it's much easier for us to say, well, we won't associate with the unbelievers because they do wrong things and we're not supposed to do those wrong things, so we'll disassociate from them. And our believing friends over here, well, sure, they, they do wrong, but they're forgiven, right? They've accepted Christ's payment. So it, it's okay, I'll, I'll just hang out with, with this little group of people. And what we have done is exactly what Satan wants us to do. We have flipped the sides. We've turned the magnet around, if you will, and we're now repelling the people we're supposed to attract, attracting the people we're supposed to repel. Compare with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not even tolerated among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. So in other words, they're priding themselves on how tolerant they are and on how accepting they are. And Paul is saying, no, 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 you've got this flipped around. He continues in verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world. See, their minds went the same place that our minds go. 
or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing you to not associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? That's a rhetorical question. Yes. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. And he is there quoting several Old Testament passages that say the exact same thing. You should be removing those who are sinning in and among you and purging them out of your congregation. But we reverse them. And I think there's at least two reasons why we, we, we reverse these concepts. The first one is we don't share God's sense of holiness. We don't share God's sense of holiness. 1 Peter 1.15 encourage us, encourages us to do that. Be holy as I am holy. But more often than not, we don't. Secondly, we don't want this to happen to us. We know full well that we are sinful just like our brothers and sisters are. And we stumble and we fall. And we fear that if we practice what's referred to as church discipline, that's what we're talking about, it seems harsh, and it seems like it might happen to us at some point. So let's, let's address those as we go on. But I want to talk just real briefly, well, maybe not briefly, I mean, when a preacher says briefly, you, yeah, anyway. Um, ashamed, this word ashamed, that he may be ashamed. Now that's interesting, because Paul is saying that you should be removing your brother who claims the name of Christ, removing him from your presence so that he may be ashamed. There was just an article in Christianity Today, I'm not sure how many of you read that, but uh, it was entitled, The Good News About Shame. And it was, it was a fairly interesting article talking about how uh, in the Western world, we really have never had a very strong concept of honor and shame whereas Eastern cultures are based almost entirely on those concepts of honor and shame. Uh, but what he was noting was that social media has or is beginning to change the way that we think about honor and shame, and in particular, or more specifically, honor, I'm sorry, fame and shame. Fame and shame, because people are realizing that in an instant, anything you say or do can be immediately posted anywhere online and anyone in the world now can have direct access to that. And so it's starting to shape, particularly the younger generation, it's starting to shape how they think about whether or not they're going to do something. They gave the example uh, in the article of a, of a guy walking down the street. He trips, a student trips, falls, you know, his books go everywhere. Uh, 50 years ago, Five people see it, and it's embarrassing, yes, but the next day, a week later, nobody knows about it. They go on with life. Well, today, that scene could very well be captured on video. Somebody was videoing something else and happened to see in the background this kid trip, and that happened. Or it can be immediately tweeted or posted on Facebook, and all of a sudden, one little incident that previously would have had small impact, now the entire world could actually look at that and see what has happened. This flows right into another, uh, I'm going to use the word ridiculous um, carefully, ridiculous notion of the European Union. Has anybody followed the right to be forgotten? Uh, if you have followed free speech at all, or you know, free speech on the internet in, partic in particular, there's this notion now in the European Union that you have the right to be forgotten. That's, that's a right that you have. And it goes something like this. Let me find it. <laughs> determine, people should be able to determine the development of their life in an autonomous way without being perpetually or periodically stigmatized as a consequence of a specific action performed in the past. Okay, so to bring that down, an 18-year-old takes her top off at a party 
And these days, there's pictures and video of that, which is then posted online. And 10 years later, she's running for political office. Anytime you search for her name, guess what you find? You find the videos and the pictures. You don't find any of the other stuff about her running for political office. And so the notion is, she should be able to go to the government and say, this, you have to order these companies to take this off the internet. For starters, I mean, that's practically impossible. The internet is not like one thing where you can just go to the internet and say, take this away. It's just a collection, a connection of various organizations and people. Uh, so once something's there, it's very difficult to get it off. Uh, but nevertheless, the notion really is that I can determine the consequences of my actions. That's what the notion is. And that's not true. All of our actions have consequences and we don't get to choose what they are. We don't get to choose how long they stick with us. So sometimes it could be that one thing that colors the rest of our life. Actions have consequences, but that's not really the main point. The main point of these two references is shame. Shame is what's driving both of these. The social media, the right to be forgotten. People are being shamed by their previous behavior and they don't like it. We don't like shame. Shame prompts us actually to do something different. And that's what Paul's picking up on. Shame prompts us to do something different. And so that's why Paul says, have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Verse 15 then do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So goodness gracious, Paul wants us to shame others. And the answer is, yeah. Compare with what we read in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink back from him in shame at his coming. Paul understands what we too quickly gloss over. These 50 years is really short term. Which would you prefer? Shame now when you have a chance to do something about it or shame when Christ returns and you have no chance to do anything about it? See, if we are lax in executing church discipline, then we're demonstrating that really we don't fear God all that much. And we don't think that shame when Christ returns is that big of a deal. It'll be washed over. But Paul and John both seem to think it's much better that that person be shamed now than later. And I tend to agree. <laughs> Not because of any of my own wisdom, but because I choose to trust what they say. So this brings us, however, to the manner, and that's what verse 15 talks about, the manner of shaming, or the mode. And that's our third point, exhort to comport. To comport means to like conform to a good standard, conform to something that's good or right. So the command is to exhort to comport, exhort one another to conform to a right standard. The goal of the shame we see in 2 Corinthians 7 where Paul says, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. That's the goal. The shame is not the end goal. If the shame was the end goal, then we would, of course, be on the wrong path. The shame is an intermediary goal towards restoration, towards repentance in the life of our brother or sister, towards bringing them back to the Lord. But what verse 15 and what 2 Corinthians and what Galatians 1 all indicate is another goodness gracious. Goodness gracious, you mean the way we go about something matters? I mean, I, th I thought I could just speak the truth, to borrow a phrase. But you're telling me that I have to speak the truth in love. 
And the answer is yes. Galatians 6.1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. In a spirit of gentleness. So it matters, just as Paul says here in verse 15, not as an enemy, but as a brother. Because your end goal is not to shame them, is not to permanently put them out. Your end goal is to restore them. Your end goal is to bring them back with the spirit of gentleness. So I know that we're, this, is, this might be the first time you've ever heard a sermon on church discipline. I think it's the first time I've ever heard one. Um, it's not very common to talk about these days. <clears throat> but lest we think it's for an older time, I will remind you that Article 4, Section 7 of our bylaws is entitled Church Discipline. That's of our very own church, believe it or not. Uh, and the model presented is what Jesus recounts for us in a short section of Matthew 18, where he says, basically, if your brother sins against you, then you should go to your brother and try to repair the situation. If that doesn't work, then you should take two or three others who either know the situation or that are elders in your church, and you should go address the situation. If that doesn't work, then you should bring this person before the congregation. And if that doesn't work, you should put them out of your congregation. That's basically the threefold plan of church discipline, of how we are to go about it. All the while, of course, keeping Galatians 6 in mind in a spirit of gentleness. So the question might legitimately come up, why do we need church discipline? Why, do, why is this something that we have to have? Well, the answer again we find in Scripture. Hebrews 3, 13. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The deceitfulness of sin. That's why we need church discipline. The deceitfulness of sin. If it were only sin, then we really wouldn't need church discipline. But the problem is, sin is deceitful. And we do something one time, and nothing happens. And we do it again, and nothing happens. And we do it a little bit more, and nothing happens. And now, the thing we did at the first no longer seems like a sin. The thing about deception, what's the thing about deception? You don't know it, right? You don't know that you're deceived. But your brother or sister sitting across the sanctuary, they can spot it pretty well. Sin has this, this interesting characteristic where it's, it's really easy for ourselves to be deceived, but it's much harder for us to deceive others into following along. So church discipline is there, at least in part, because of the deceitfulness of sin. We ought to be on guard not treating one another as enemies, right? That's the wrong mindset. Treating one another as brothers, realizing that this life is short. The next life is long. It's much better to experience shame and to deal with problems here and now than to face them at the end. So, in conclusion, I think the words of James in chapter 5 are fitting. My brothers... If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. See, what really is at stake is life and death. And as we look at these three commands, do right with all of your might, discipline wrong all day long, exhort to comport, you can see, I hope, how they are interrelated. Because as we walk one step in front of the other and the daily grind is more and more grinding and we're more and more likely to fall out of step with the word, we need one another to encourage us, to exhort us, and sometimes to take what we see as harsh or drastic measures 
to confront us and to say, hey, what you're doing is wrong, but come back. Jesus still loves you. I still love you. Come back. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We pray that you would give us your sense of holiness. We pray that you would give us your love, a love that looks at eternity, not at the next five minutes. Help us to see one another through your eyes. Help us to see one another as we one day will be glorified with you. And Lord, may that motivate us to do what is oftentimes the more difficult thing and to confront our brothers. Lord, we also pray that by your people, your spirit working in and through us, that you would encourage us to press on day in and day out. In Jesus' name, amen.